good evening everyone thank you for joining good evening everyone പ്രദീപിനെ വിളിച്ചോണ്ട് പറയാ ഇത് രണ്ട് രണ്ട് സിസ്റ്റം ഇരിക്കണം പറഞ്ഞു നിർമ്മല സീതാരാമൻ presented a transformative union budget 2024-2025 on July 23, 2024. The minister presented the 62-page document at the Lok Sabha, Delhi. In the budget, a detailed roadmap for pursuit of Vixit Bharat was set with nine budget priorities, which include productivity and resilience in agriculture, employment and skilling, inclusive human resource development and social justice manufacturing and services urban development energy security infrastructure innovation research and development and next generation reforms the interim budget focused on four major community garib which is poor mahlian who are women yuva who are youth and annadada the farmers The budget particularly focused on employment, skilling, MSMEs and the middle class. I am sure some of you might have heard about the post budget analysis in newspapers, radio, podcast, online portals, television, debate, etc. You would probably think why Infopark is organizing a post budget analysis. We want our community to be informed, to understand what is partially known to them. I am sure there are experts among the participants who are fully aware. Well, we need your support in taking this forward and help our CEOs, CFOs, directors, company heads, HRs, IT employees and even students and well-wishers to analyze Union Budget 2024. On that note, let me wholeheartedly welcome the speakers of the post-budget analysis. Hearty welcome to Anand Bhandari, Savit P. Gopal, and pradeep a to this wonderful session over to the speakers sure sure thank you thank you thank you, thank you sir for, for the warm introduction and setting the context, context. Okay. So, so thank you thank, thank you participants for joining on this evening um, to understand the post budget analysis uh, i have with me my colleague savit gopal and also mr pradeep narayanan uh, we are part of bsr uh, a chartered accountancy firm uh, we are here to take you through the nitty gritties of what has been introduced in the said budget 
to introduce myself uh, i am anand mandari um, i have been with the firm for last 14 years specializing in corporate and international tax uh, helping a lot of la- large and small corporates to set up their business in india and also help them with uh, in their tax efficiency in their business uh, moving on uh, i would be covering the corporate tax and the personal tax part of it mr savit gopal would be looking at the indirect tax gst part of it gst and customs and mr a pradeep would be discussing on the transferring part of it i would also um, cover the economic overview uh, of of what the budget has come up with and where is the india in, in recent times grown and i hope this is an interactive session and you find the find this a little more useful and insightful as well moving on talking about the economic outlook of india uh, i hope everybody is able to hear and and please interrupt if there is any kind of disturbance uh, in the conversation okay uh, talking about uh, the indian economy as you are all aware uh, last year has been a fantastic year uh, 23 24 where india has grown at the rate of 8.2% however based on the economic survey which was recently released one day before the budget india is having a i would say a conservative outlook towards growth around 6.5 to 7% the reason being uh, the huge geopolitical uh, environment that's that's around um, across the world second uh, very clearly articulated by madam fm on the job creation and skill development and also developing infrastructure at the same pace having said that uh, you can see for yourself on the screen that our tax collections have been robust both on indirect tax and direct tax Uh, where we have grown around 13.4 percent, our infrastructure development spend has been increased year on year close to 29 percent. Our foreign reserves are at the peak um, at 68 billion, uh, grew by 68 billion at 653.7 billion, and uh, our stock markets, where every individual is investing today in the market, uh, at around uh, it is capitalized around six USD six trillion mark. Having said all of this, the most uh, appealing part in the presentation is our fiscal deficit coming down um, to close to 4.3% uh, which was close to 9% during the covid period and this is something uh, which i think madam fm is very clear that we are moving towards closing to 4% in in finance by financial year 2026 2027 uh, so this has been uh, with regard to the economic outlook of india in recent times moving on uh, if you look at the key features of the budget um, yes uh, shweta did talk about the five pillars and and the cast that madam fm wanted to focus today very clearly um, as i said in my initial part of the phase um, job creation skilling uh, were the clear opportunities which we are looking because after make in india uh, what india could realize is that a lot of job and skill labor is is the need of the hour for the country in order to house uh, the fdis that are coming in day in day in different sectors obviously there are considering fdi and odi there has been um, it has been promised that the whole entry process would be smooth and there'll be rules which will be um, organized uh, there have been places where um, the ib ibc has been a very successful mission for the country uh, where they have been able to close down uh, a lot of different companies and and get a, a lot of cash unlocked for the country comprehensively the custom duties have have come down for major part of the um, import uh, equipments that are getting imported and what dr madam fm has also said is that in next 6 months they are going to look at a complete overall of the income tax act as well while today the act has been there for 50 plus years uh, having said that still a complete revamp of income tax act uh, is going to be interesting because a lot of learning curve has been um, developed over the period of period of time another important thing was the amnesty scheme under direct tax um, which i would talk in greater detail in my up- upcoming slides uh, tds and angel tax being abolished also another feather in the cap uh, while discussing on the budget this time from a mergers and acquisition and corporate tax perspective now uh, considering uh, the interest of the audience i would talk about um, the long term capital gain aspects and the mergers and acquisition aspect of the budget first considering this has got a lot of uh, light uh, apart from other things in the budget this time moving on uh, there has been a lot of confusion in um, in interpreting the provisions as to what is long term what is short term which asset industrial land agriculture land 
shares, gold, uh, all any other capital asset. There's been a lot of confusion. People had to look at five or six ready reckoners to understand what is the period of holding. Uh, with this amendment, the intent is very clear that all financial asset, um, say mostly listed companies, listed units would be 12 months and any other unlisted securities or capital assets is going to be 24 months. So this kind of clear gives a clear message in terms of how uh, the entire capital gain tax in the country needs to get streamlined and it is moving in that direction. Having spoken about uh, the period of holding and clarity around that, uh, what one of the major amendments that has come in the screen that you can see is that the long-term capital gain on, on, on capital assets have been reduced from 20% to 12.5%. While it's a welcome move for resident shareholders or resident Indians, uh, it could jeopardize a lot of foreign citizens who have invested uh, looking at saying getting a reduced rate. So initial rate was 10% for them. Now that gets increased to 12.5%. Uh, but the major change in the entire capital gain amendment is impacted the bonds and debentures market, where it has been um, amended to say that irrespective of the holding period, a bond and debentures would be subject to tax as per the slab rates. Example, if it's a company, it should be 25%. In the hands of the individual, it could be close to 35%. So this has been the major change um, in terms of, say, immovable property, shares, and capital asset. And... Uh, Having said that the rate has been reduced, another big change uh, that would impact the crowd at large is removing the indexation benefit. So the entire cost inflation indexation benefit that is allowed to upstream your cost or upgrade your cost is removed now. And uh, on the other hand, the capital gains tax rate has been reduced. Having said that, uh, the fair for, for assets which have been inherited by your grandparents to the to the SSE, that would get in uh, that for that the fair market value up to two thousand would be considered, and for the last twenty four years you will not get the indexation benefit. Uh, you might be aware that erstwhile well, eighteen eighty one or nineteen eighty one was the year in which last FMV was introduced, and after that it was revised to two thousand. So all inherited property up to two thousand you can take FMV as the cost of acquisition, and post that uh, there'll be no further indexation allowed and you will have to pay capital gain tax at 12.5%. Moving on, these are for other securities uh, that 12.5% and what is the effective tax rate, uh, maybe this slide would help you understand better each uh, for each type of asset class, what is the tax rate as per the residential status pre and post 12th July, because this particular amendment is effective from 23rd July 2024, right? Uh, yes, so moving on. The other big change which has come is abolishing the buyback tax and considering the same as dividend tax or any amount which is paid to the shareholders uh, during the buyback process would be going forward be considered as a deemed dividend and withholding tax would apply to it like a dividend unlike what it is it was buyback tax before this does not just stop here what the other amendment is that if a particular share is bought for X value and today it is sold for X plus 10, while the entire 10 would be subject to tax, the cost of X would not be allowed to be reduced. That is, the cost of acquisition of the shares will not be allowed to adjust against the sale consideration. However, it will be allowed as a, a loss carry forward in the hands of the SSE. So this could impact, example, if there's a one-time shareholder who just bought an asset for once and wants to sell it, and does not intend to buy this, buy a share or anything again, it's going to be a, a double whammy for him because one side he's going to pay capital gain tax on the entire sale consideration. And on the other side, on the other hand, he, will, he might not get to use the long-term capital loss. So this change is going to impact uh, a lot of promoter clients and, and a lot of shareholders who have invested in multiple entities. And if those entities want to upstream cash um, in a buyback scheme, um, the company law regulations of buyback will still apply. That is only the 25% of uh, paid up capital and reserves can get upstreamed. Uh, but otherwise, this will be considered as dividend for the purpose of uh, Income Tax Act. We'll have also have to see how capital reduction and buyback would get differentiated under the law because both of them effectively serve the same purpose. Okay, capital reduction could be through a court scheme and buyback is just through the provisions of uh, say board resolutions and, and internal affairs of the entity. 
it'll be very interesting to look at as to how capital reduction um, rules come up or the buyback rules come up uh, from an income tax perspective the other important change is abolishing angel tax as you might be aware uh, the valuation norms for invest in investment and assets in india has been regulated for a pretty long of period of time maybe uh, let it be fema companies act income tax act fema always had a floor price that is a minimum price in which an investor can invest into india and considering a lot of startups coming up in the recent times uh, the income tax had come with a ceiling price uh, in the name of angel tax so there was always a range that the shareholder was bound with uh, looking at fema and income tax together but now um, this this is a welcome move where the entire ceiling price under the income tax has been removed so one who has to invest into indian shares and securities might as well just look at the fema valuation that is the floor price and go about investing so this is a major change uh, for the startup environment i would say the other big change for from an mna or mergers and acquisition trans, uh, perspective is curtailing the reassessment proceedings to 5 years 3 months from an existing 10 year period i will talk to talk about this in greater detail when i do the corporate tax changes and then this uh, from a mna perspective what this helps is the deal review time and the mna transaction time is substantially reduced because i don't have to go back 10 years and look at all the documents and only focus on the last 5 years document because beyond 5 years the assess the assessing officer cannot open a case going forward this is effective from 1st september 24 onwards so hence for april year, april 20, uh, 24 to 25 could be the relevant period going forward Next. the other changes is the withholding tax assessment as well there was no timeline per se with regard to how an assessment for withholding tax will happen now that has been defined to 6 years so this also gets a lot of certainty for your due diligence process or or a or a health check process for the entity uh gifting of shares by one company to another company was a common trend considering this was not considered as a transfer before or there was a gap in in the understanding there clarity is brought to say that only an individual and an hgf can gift to someone else out of love and affection uh, a corporate giving gift to another corporate or another individual will not be considered as a gift going forward and will be considered as a taxable transaction the other change was for with regard to offer for sale uh, this was uh, way back in 2018 when the long term capital gain was removed on listed securities there were certain conditions bought for offer for market uh, sale uh, kind of transactions wherein um, the cost of acquisition there was a formula which was introduced that formula has been further upgraded now to say uh, the indexation benefit and others would there'll be specific rules which will be defined for these categories of shares which are sold after july 23 2024 right the other big jolt uh, on the trader community is that uh, the for the fno transaction the duties or the stamp duties have uh, stamp uh, security transaction rates have been increased by 80% from 0.0625% to 0.1% for options and from 0.125% to 0.02% for futures so that's a massive uh, uh, cost that has been imposed on the traders on fno the other administrative changes are uh, simplified fdi and odi process going forward uh, a vcc which is a variable capital company a structure that will be introduced and will be allowed to invest in the pe uh, a venture capital fund would be introduced specifically for space economy and as i said a comprehensive review of the income tax will happen over the next 6 months i will now move on to the corporate tax proposal um, which would would give a lot of um, i would like to want to start with the positives in the corporate tax uh, proposals like the amnesty scheme vivat se vishwas scheme which is available 2 years back that has been or 4 years back if i have to be precise that has been uh, reintroduced now uh, looking at the great success that the erstwhile policy had there are few administrative changes in the policy has been made uh, looking at the learning curve of the last policy you can see on the screen um, in order to close a particular litigation matter um, taxes up to 110% or or 120% needs mm -hmm. to be paid and penalty around 35% or in case of uh, a department appeal and then a not department appeal a particular range of penalty will have to be paid going forward so this is a another welcome move which will help 
close or long run litigation that a company or an individual is running with the income tax department by actually paying the cash and and paying partial penalty uh, in in terms of tax and penalty the other change which has come is a lot of applications were pending before the advance authority for advance ruling and then uh, the bar was introduced while the bar was introduced it was not equipped with a lot of benches and members to take up the hearing uh, so the whole purpose of providing certainty under the ar was not achieved uh, and on the other hand during the transition process there was no withdrawal mechanism which was allowed between ar to bar now that has been introduced with a timeline of december of october 24 and uh, and this has to be closed by the bar by 31st december 2024 so this will also uh, give a lot of uh, opportunity for for assessees to understand whether they want to be part of the bar or come out and look at alternatives having said that um, you are aware the reassessment proceedings uh, apart from other assessment proceedings in the income tax act has been part of the amendments in all the budgets in the recent times uh, considering that this was at the discretion of the officer to use his power to reassess even on his own mistakes or or say uh, something that he missed during during the during the original assessment uh, the intent was to not be biased and and give an opportunity to the assessee that if he has disclosed everything right uh, reassessment should not happen working on the same direction uh, there have been changes now first with regard to timeline saying a maximum reassessment can happen only uh, to the period of 5 years and 3 months as well it was 10 years which is pretty draconian uh, now there has been fresh process which has been introduced uh, for carrying out a reassessment proceedings what they have also added is during a search proceeding if there is something which is identified that can also be a good information for for them to suspect that you have incapped you have in, your income has escaped assessment and you need to go through a 148 proceeding they have added few um, prescribed additional commissioners and and additional directors also in the whole process from an approval perspective i think uh, apart from all other changes in the corporate tax side the most draconian change which has come is under section 245 which says uh, or the current provision says if there is a refund which is outstanding income tax refund which is outstanding and if there is a demand which is outstanding then net of that demand you should get the refund in your hands apart from that uh, recently there was another amendment to say that if the assessing officer believes that granting this refund would adversely affect the revenue that is i might not get future tax collections which are due then he can hold the refund now this whole statement of him having an opinion has been deleted now this has gone into mechanical terms in when i say mechanical terms if you have a refund outstanding on the other hand you also have a parallel assessment proceedings on uh, outstanding then the ao does not have to form an opinion he can simply hold the refund till the assessment proceedings are closed one may wonder uh, at all point in times and as in one particular assessment year would be open and a particular refund would be due with that does mean that i will never get my refund technically speaking it is a situ possible situation but we'll have to uh, obviously follow up with the officer to not form such judgment and issue us refund on time and just because few assessment proceedings are open we should not get our uh, taxes withheld there so this is i think uh, uh, this the department is going to use to their advantage and hold refunds and not issue refunds going forward <coughs> sorry another welcome move is for the foreign companies where the corporate tax rate has been reduced from 40% to 35% so that's a good change we see a lot of fdis coming in through um, indian subsidiaries we might see more project offices and branches being set up considering the reduced rate another welcome move is apart from various taxes that we pay equalization levy also was a was a substantial tax that an entity used to pay for e-commerce operations that has been abolished going forward so that is going to be a good relief because compliance is around it also were complex for an assc to conduct and this is going to be an advantage to the assc going forward however equalization levy on advertisement has not been uh, has been not been removed that at 6% will still continue what has been removed is only 2% on e-commerce operations so that's a, a another notable change uh, to make a note of now on the screen you can see uh, the tax rates for withholding which has been reduced for major amount of transactions be it commission be it lottery be it insurance policy 
uh, this is something which is uh, handy and will give a lot of cash flow to the SSE, um, considering tax will not be withheld in BU the de department. On the other hand, for purchase of property going forward, it is going to be the transaction value. Example, if the to total property size is 60 lakhs, if you divide by 10 people, you will have to still do the withholding of tax. You cannot escape 194 IA just because you're breaking the transaction between two people. What matters would be the, the transaction value. And if the transaction value is above 50 lakhs, then you'll have to pay tax on it. The other change is an attempt to clarify differences between 194C and 194J. While they have attempted to bring some clarity, but we believe there is still a lot of open gap there. And uh, government will have to come with clarifications to kind of clarify this. Another new section which has been introduced is for partnership firms who are paying salary remuneration and commission to their partners. Going forward, they will be subject to a withholding of 10%. So this will have a cash flow issue on the, on the hands of the partners who were now withdrawing without any withholding tax uh, from the firm. The TCS interest rate has been increased for any delayed payments from 1% to 1.5%. Uh, this is in line with what is happening for TDS as well. Uh, with regard to prosecution proceedings, also there have been procedural changes there. And, and largely it says if you're able to pay the TDS before you file your TDS return, then the prosecution proceedings might not be initiated on you. And I think this is pretty serious concern uh, from an SSC perspective, I would say that the department is very, very conscious of how the TDS withholding is happening and how the credit movement is happening from time to time. So, so this is something that you'll have to look at. Okay. Uh, another change is that erstwhile for 194Q, that is when you had a purchase of sale of goods above 50 lakhs, you were not allowed to go for a dispension order or a no TDS deduction order. But going forward, you have this opportunity. You can cover uh, your 197 applications, including 194Q as well. So that's a welcome change. I think this will give a lot of relief to SECs whose lot of TDS is deducted under sales and purchases. Moving forward, um, I would spend some time on the personal tax aspect. As you're all aware, there's no major change. But what is the trend that we see is that uh, Madam FM wants every SEC to go towards the new regime. Basis are stats, we understand 80% of the SSE already are under the new regime and the old regime is only applicable for 20% of the SSEs today in the, in the income tax world. Uh, having said that, in the new regime, there's no major change in the slabs. Uh, just that uh, the standard deduction has been increased to 75,000 under the new regime and the national pension scheme has also increased from 10 to 14%. Apart from that, we don't see any major change uh, from a personal tax perspective. There has been clarity on TDS and TCS uh, to point out one, uh, if you have um, TDS deducted on say purchase of car or property on your name, you can disclose to this, this to your employer and ask him to consider this as a net payment when they do the salary tax. So if your salary TDS is deducted at a particular rate, you can show this certificate and say my taxes are already paid. And so he does not have to deduct another amount of tax which gets stuck with the department. So this also gives a lot of cash flow efficiency to the salaried employees and it is a much awaited uh, change that we were looking at because a lot of issues that were considered or discussed with us from an employee perspective. TCS in the hands of minor, uh, mostly when uh, a minor is going out for education, there's TCS deducted. Uh, that was going wasted because a minor was not filing a return or was not having any income to set off. This can be now clubbed with the parent and he can uh, the parents can take the credit of it so this will also uh, help them save cost in terms of tax credits. There have been penalty um, now in, introduced to say that if any kind of non-disclosure which is found on foreign assets, uh, more specifically in value of about 20 lakhs, then there will be a penalty of 10 lakhs going forward. So it is very, very uh, strictly advisable that you look at your tax returns very closely and anything on foreign assets, including bank accounts, are equally disclosed and properly disclosed in the tax in the tax return. Otherwise, there is a direct penalty of ten lakhs on this transaction. So this is something um, which is uh, concerning for a lot of NRI employees or employees moving between countries for either work or business. Uh, I would spend a minute on um, I was saying about job creation. That was the focus of this particular budget. 
the department or the finance minister is looking at as to how maximum skill development can happen and they are working with the epfo authorities to come up with schemes you can see four schemes on the screen wherein uh, the effort is to give some amount of cash back or pay back to the employer for generating new and fresh employees and training them also on the job also providing them internship facilities so that um, there's a huge pool of skill labor which which is formed which can be used for india operations going forward so we'll have to watch out for how this schemes blueprint comes and whether this is beneficial for an employer to take up or apply for it obviously this comes with a lot of commitment because this is applicable only for additional number of employees and not existing employees sure yeah. i would also spend some time on the db proposals uh, while nothing has been introduced under the budget this time under the dp proposals uh, there has been a direction towards uh, specific transactions which says uh, for safe harbor there are more number of transactions or industry types which will get introduced under the safe harbor rule uh, which will enable a lot of assessees to to get into the safe harbor and avoid litigation uh, this is something that we'll have to watch out for because today there are enough safe harbors for say auto ITITS, which is there, uh, with more industries getting covered, uh, this will streamline the litigation um, environment from a transparent perspective. Further, there has been um, additional powers introduced to the hands of the TPO, for not only for international transactions but also for specific domestic transactions, wherein it says an assessing officer is referring a transaction, then he will have a power to look at the domestic transaction as well, and this is effective from April 25 onwards. So these are the two. two changes uh, from a transfer pricing perspective and and uh, the rules around this or the amendments around this uh, would be interesting to look at when the same are introduced uh, i would now uh, want to pass on the mic to mr savit gopal uh, who will be taking us through the indirect tax proposals thank you savit you are on mute savit sorry uh, uh, i have been with the firm for around uh, 12 years now um, and uh, while anand and most of my colleagues are uh, have a chartered accountant background i i am a lawyer basically uh, by uh, qualification and have been uh, uh, was practicing in chennai for around 6 years and then from 2012 onwards have been with the firm um now uh, we Uh, there is nothing surprising as far as indirect tax is concerned because in june when the 53rd gst council uh, convened and they came out with whatever their recommendations were we were pretty much clear as to where uh, what all changes we can expect and uh, the legal changes or the changes in the law is brought has been brought about by the budget and on a random basis depending upon what interest people we have put it across so that we can discuss that uh, gayatri can we go to the next slide please yeah so uh, this is a there is an amnesty that is provided uh, which waives of interest and penalty in specified cases a new section has been introduced and this is this waiver is provided for the years 17 18 till 1920 and uh, the conditions are that you have to pay the full tax and the appeal which you have filed must be withdrawn before the notified date so that is the requirement and very clearly they exclude erroneous refunds and unfortunately those people who have paid the tax demand and the interest and penalty they will not get any relief uh, because there is no refund of the amount that is already paid so uh, but however beneficial uh, in the sense that small litigations which are there um, um, and where the matters are dicey uh, the ssc can choose to go for this amnesty so that they can avoid interest and penalty and one important point is that fraudulent cases 
are not covered here. So only notices and notices and proceedings under Section 73 is covered here and not proceedings under 74. Then they, they are uh, introducing a, a new Section 11A, which, which actually uh, those people who are uh, who have been from the excise regime will see that uh, there was a 11 section 11c uh, provision was there where there was any doubt as to a levy of a particular product whether it is manufactured or not then the government even though the department might be uh, raising an issue the government can issue a notification providing some relief to the uh, manufacturers a similar provision has been brought in in gst and uh, um, if i can draw a parallel uh, you you will be aware of the issue of corporate guarantee whether it is taxable uh, whether it is taxable from 2017 or whether from october to 2023 those kind of issues are going on people have not paid taxes a uh, lot of clarifications have been brought in uh, during the 53rd gst council uh, meeting government can if they want to test how this works uh, this is a perfect time uh, the section 11a once section 11a introduces government can think about uh, uh, um, issuing a notification under 11a to give some relief to those people who have not paid any taxes on corporate guarantee that's an example that we can say where this section 11a uh, comes into picture next slide uh, Gantri. Uh, another small relief that is provided for the SSEs is the time limit to avail ITC uh, for the period from 1718 till 2021 has been extended to 30th November 2021. So anyone who has taken credit for the period 17, 1718 before 30th November 2021 they can avail that and if there is any litigation this will provide relief to them however if the tax or itc has already been reversed again you are under a problem this provision will not benefit you so those who have already paid are at a loss while those who are litigating with the government saying that the supplier did not issue me invoice it he uploaded it much later will get a relief Another uh, interesting thing that they have uh, introduced is there was a restriction if the supplier did not uh, pay any taxes and subsequently the government issues a notice or the department issues a notice under Section 74, which is uh, uh, alleging that they have committed fraud, the vendor who subsequently receives receives a tax invoice from the supplier was not entitled to take credit because the, this was even during the service tax period um, continued even in the GST that provision they have tried to give some benefit saying that the uh, recipient of the service or the goods can take credit even if the supplier is paying taxes post a show cost notice or a demand uh, from by the department which is which alleges fraud so this is a welcome thing they are trying to reduce litigation because um, they they believe that the supplier also will not litigate if they are able to pass on that tax demand to the uh, recipient and if the recipient is able to take the credit he will be more willing to take that hit also so that's the uh, that seems to be the idea behind it and they have in they have in and this 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 particular benefit is only post physical year 24 25 that is from 24 25 and they have also included that there are check post matters which happen and if some payments of tax are made during detention or seizure or there is a confiscation of goods tax is being tax gets paid to um, gets the confiscation removed and release the goods then credit of those have also been allowed 
then there was one issue with respect to um, uh, the credit that was being transitioned uh, by an input service distributor when the invoices and the um, <clears throat> uh, invoices were pertaining to the services were issued prior to the uh, appointed day which is july 2017 this was a lacuna it was pretty much clear that that should be allowed but maybe some litigations will would have happened and they have made it clear that even if the invoices are issued and the services are also received prior to the appointed day and the credits can be by the input service distributor can be transitioned uh, to the gst regime and uh, another interesting thing was um, uh, i'm sure some of the people might be ha might have faced this issue as to let us assume that tax is not paid under rcm for a particular import of service the question was and if the services import of service happened some time back uh, and i have lost the time period uh, in a particular financial year whether that credit can be uh, taken if i raise a self invoice today and um, um, pay the taxes under rcm now what they have clarified is that even though there is a time limit that is fixed for um, uh, raising the self invoice they are saying the date in which the self invoice or the year in which the self invoice is raised becomes the year which gives you the entitlement to take the credit so for the past uh, 23 24 even if the self invoice is raised in this year 24 25 then 30th november of 24 uh, 30th november of uh, 25 becomes the due date by which you can take the credit so that benefit has been uh, provided to the uh, provided to the ssc's uh, next slide uh, gayatri then another interesting change is combining both uh, section 73 and this is applicable from 24 25 um, it is not immediately brought into force uh, combining of 73 and 75 uh, 74 into a new section called 74a what it provides what the advantage that it provides to the uh, government is that the officer ha can issue a notice under one particular section and if he chooses he can invoke uh, the allegation of fraud the time limit remains the same he can he has to issue a notice in for 42 months and he has to pass an order in 12 months, which is extendable um, uh, by, a, by a period of six months uh, uh, to pass the order. That is that is done. And if for some reason the allegation of fraud is not sustainable, he can immediately um, uh, protect the demand under normal, uh, normal thing, which is without the allegation of fraud. So, the penalty, uh, even though the uh, uh, stringent penalty of uh, fraud does not apply, he can sustain the demand. There was some challenges in um, there was some challenges uh, um, during this the the current provision of seventy three and seventy four. The officers were facing some challenges because they were not clear as to which provision to invoke for raising the demand, and they have sorted it out. One advantage here for the taxpayer is uh, the point that earlier it was 30 days. If uh, if a demand is confirmed, they, they were given a 30 day window to pay the tax demand along with interest to close the proceedings and certain benefit was provided to as far as penalty was uh, given. That time limit has been increased from 30 days to 60 days. So that is the uh, change that they have brought it. Now, if we come to the time limit for filing appeal, there was a lot of confusion as to even though the GST tribunal is not formed, uh, they, they uh, and the president has assumed office, uh, whether what is the time limit for filing an appeal before the uh, uh, tribunal. So they have brought in a clear provision that 
there will be a time of three months for filing appeal in a tribunal from a date to be notified. So once the tribunal is completely formed, a date will be notified and you will have a three months time to file the appeal. Another interesting change is uh, there were a lot of investigations which were happening and uh, during the investigation summons were issued to the mds the top management people who were the who were listed as the directors or a whole time directors and they were asked to appear before the officers there which which gave, which uh, presented some difficulties because they are not into the day to day operations or tax matters and everything and uh, the, the the evidence that they gave became um, uh, was um, was um, used by the officers to uh, preparing their uh, demand notices. So now what they have done is they have allowed an authorized representative to appear before the uh, uh, proper officer on behalf of the person summoned. So even though a director is summoned, the person responsible for the tax matters can appear and provide uh, responses on behalf of the uh, person summoned. Next slide, Gayatri. Now, anti-profiteering, there is a sunset clause, may not be applicable to any of, any of those people here. Uh, whatever pending cases, it is being transferred to the GST appellate tribunal. So that is taken care of. Uh, export duty refund, um, this is applicable in the case of people who export goods. Uh, they were taking the benefit of refunds, even though the goods that were exported were duty liable, um, um, that they have restricted. There is no ITC or um, a, a refund of unutilized ITC or with payment uh, GST refund is prohibited going forward for goods which are applicable for export duty. Again, um, um, some uh, some administrative changes like uh, those people, especially government um, organizations where they are uh, liable to deduct TDS. There is the, they, they, they have brought in a uh, mandatory requirement that even if there is no TDS to be deducted and reported for a particular month, they have to file a monthly nil return that, that they have brought into force. With this, we come to the end of the GST. And one important point is all these are applicable uh, once the assent is obtained from the president after both, uh, both uh, after it is approved by the central and the state governments, not only the uh, legislatures of the respective center and the state legislature. So it is only after that a date will be notified and uh, the, all these provisions will be made applicable. So with Pradeep will want to come in um, on the transfer pricing bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Pradeep, you're there. Yeah. Am I audible, Anand? Yes, yes, Pradeep. Yes, sure. No, thanks. So yes, so um, this is something important and very relevant for uh, service companies in the services space. Uh, and uh, what uh, Madam FM touched upon as transfer pricing, safe harbor provision likely to kind of see an expansion in the scope of safe harbor provision. Many of you may be aware that uh, companies in services space were offered something as safe harbor, wherein by following a particular markup rate up to a particular turnover threshold, they were found to be compliant with the transfer pricing you know, requirement. So. Many companies, what we have seen, especially in the last at least three years, had expressed interest to take the safe harbor route on a litigated you no know, transfer pricing aspect to just kind of keep it simple from an administrative aspect, follow what the government has provided as a guideline for a safe harbor you no know, rate to be applicable to them and uh, comply with it. And uh, there has been representation from uh, many medium to uh, larger uh, IT, GCC and uh, captive service companies to make this applicable to them. And one may remember 
initially when the safe harbor was brought into the income tax law for the purpose of compliance with transfer pricing by captive companies the required markups were high 22 percent 21 percent finally in the last six years the modification was made to bring it down to 17 and 18 uh, percent that is up company with a turnover up to 100 crores required to apply a 17 percent and 100 to 200 is 18 percent and more than 200 crore companies were not permitted to come within the safe harbor provision so based on uh, due representations made by nascom and a couple of it which we were also part of some bit of a push on this uh, and uh, now the expectation in the new safe harbor revised rules the scope would likely to get extended with the upper cap on the turnover and perhaps more nature of service getting added today we have for it its r d kpo then interest also safe harbor is provided and some kind of a safe harbor is there for auto ancillary companies also but clearly in the services space where transfer pricing is a matter of issue for both jurisdictions india and overseas jurisdiction the way the you no know, customer is so this is widely expected to bring in some kind of a relief if it gets applied but one will have to wait and see whether the percentage will come down the mark of 17 and 18 whether it will come down and what is the threshold that they will increase so this is a positive thing at least an indication from the government that this is likely to be relooked and uh, no streamlined so that is on the safe harbor and uh, there is something that to watch out for because now what is coming up looks like is the power of the transfer pricing officer is going to get you no know, enhanced with the way with respect to scrutiny of specified domestic transactions so specified domestic transactions are those transactions which are in the nature of transactions relating to goods or service between a company uh, uh, with another company or another unit within the same company which has a differential or lower rate of tax or a tax holiday whether it is 10 aa or atia atib which are 115 bab so another you no know, entity which is formed in the new tax uh, regime so there all these things it was um, under the purview of the assing officer now those transactions the transfer pricing officer can get into it individually by himself without any reference also to determine whether any higher profit is parked in the entity which has a lower rate of tax so given this jurisdiction and this right is given to the transfer pricing officer he will look at these transactions with the same wavelength with the same lens and he would try and determine whether excess profits are there so it's an issue of not lower profit it's an issue of perhaps whether excess profit is there in the uh, in the in the company which has a lower rate of tax so one has to kind of create some similar level of documentation because there was a reporting requirement which is still there in the form 3 ceb that these transactions have to be disclosed and highlighted if it is seen okay the by the certifying accountant if there are excess profits in the transaction normally we have seen nobody reports this nobody holds out that profits are excessive in a low tax uh, paying company on their transaction but we, despite not reporting anything the transfer pricing officer can get into the scrutiny and decide whether it is so or otherwise so word of caution that uh, where you have uh, you are you are a company transacting with a, another company which has uh, eligible for a preferential or lower tax rate then to also ensure that you no know, the there is an arm's length uh, determination of rightful uh, return uh, that you have maintained and not you have sold uh, not that you have underpriced or you no know, moved some profits in the transaction to the other entity so with this perhaps i will uh, wrap up on the transfer pricing proposals uh, while uh, the, and and we will closely follow through and we'll be happy to share what is the final outcome and uh, decision and uh, you no know, revised uh, rules that get framed out on these matters so happy to pass this to anand and uh, yeah yeah thank you thank you pradeep uh, for the insights on from a transfer pricing perspective 
uh, I think now uh, we are open to questions from corporate tax, M&A, GST, and transfer pricing. And, and I'm happy to share our thoughts on the same. Any specific questions you can you know, either discuss on the mic or put it on the chat box so that we can um, take it up and discuss. So we wait for a minute. Uh, if any further questions or Shweta, then over to you. I think let's wait for another minute. Sure. sure. Yeah. If there are any questions related to the union budget, floor is open to that. In fact, I have a question, Shweta. Yes, yes. So please, I was please. wondering, uh, what are the changes that the companies, especially IT service companies, has to look upon in this budget, or what would affect them? Okay. See, so um, maybe Pradeep was over. You want to take, or I can go ahead. Okay. Very specifically, from a service industry perspective. There are no major amendments here, right? But having said that, uh, there are amendments in the capital gains part of it, where a lot of FDI is coming into the service companies. A lot of promoter companies who are setting up their entities uh, in the ITITS space, it is relevant for them to look at uh, that particular provisions where long-term and short-term capital gains are involved. Further, uh, considering a lot of job creation is the focus, so one has to look at, um, IT companies can look at those incentive programs, which there are four incentive programs which are going to come up and that are going to give a lot of cash flow um, on the spending uh, that the big organizations, IT organizations are going to do in order to say train the employees or give internship facilities or, or give employment opportunities to the new employees. I think this too could be the major, uh, what do you call change or, or upcoming thing from an, from this budget for IT companies to look at. Maybe Savit and Pradeep, if you want to add something on this. No, Ananda, nothing specific to IT, general uh, changes only. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, it is worthwhile to keep a watch. Again, uh, needless to reiterate by me that uh, this is safe harbor where uh, service companies are in a captive environment uh, to avoid uh, the litigative environment, especially in the field of transfer pricing. Uh, it is uh, worthwhile to just kind of wait and watch uh, whether in terms of the specified markup, which uh, is likely perhaps should come within a month, uh, whether it is good to kind of get into a safe harbor regime and then you know, be insulated from transfer pricing audits and scrutiny. I think it's, uh, it's something close to watch out and uh, be aware as and when it comes to see how it can apply. Yes, yeah, so that, the, that answers your question, right? Yes, yes. yes. And again, and perhaps, yeah. perhaps, perhaps, uh, Anand, you may want to reiterate that some of the past litigation, if it is worthwhile to look at, uh, Viva, uh, no, VSV. Viva yeah, 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 that perhaps. is something that I touched upon the amnesty scheme, which has been reintroduced. Uh, one may look at their existing litigation and see if they want to uh, bite the bullet and pay the taxes now and avoid undue litigation cost uh, from, from an income tax side of it. Obviously, something is coming from a GST side also, which has not been introduced yet. 
but uh, currently income tax one is introduced and that is good to watch for and i think this budget uh, has given a focus on youth of india um can you tell me what are the reforms made for youth Uh, you mean you? Yes, yes. What yeah, are so, the yeah, so. features or what are the special um, characteristics announced in the budget for the youth? Okay. See, again, very specifically, when you say youth, uh, the focus or what is the shortfall which has been identified from an economic overview perspective is that a lot of job creation and skill development. is required in the indian economy in order to support the existing manufacturing companies service companies and also the new companies which are getting set up so we are looking at a say growth target of 6 and 1/2 to 7% as against 8.5% which was there for last year the only reason for this reduction is that we are not able to bridge the job gap while the gdp and everything is growing we are not able to create enough job opportunities for our um, say citizens in india so now there is a renewed focus by madam fm to say that all corporates going forward have to add in more employees develop the skill here in india and ensure that the whole make in india the whole manufacturing the whole service industry of the country is improvised which supports the gdp at large so uh, to to promote that there are four incentive schemes which are there one which says for every additional employee they will give you a cash back second for every internship opportunity there will be a cost reimbursement that will happen third uh, this is linked to um, the epfo so any pf contribution that is done there is a cash back on that also uh, of course there are devil lies in the detail when how the scheme comes as to what each scheme has a condition what is the lock in period uh, what amount of uh, salaries would be covered is it 25000 50000 1 lakh all of that is equally important um on the other hand the states are also coming up with policies to promote gccs to promote idits companies uh, to promote certain manufacturing entities so all of this is focused towards youth is what i would like to tell great interesting i i think uh, our state kerala is looking forward to bringing up more gccs to the yes yes thanks and we being a, an it hub we are also looking forward to seeing more employment being generated and more foreign direct investments coming up i mean i think i think emphasis on employment uh, emphasis on education i think both thousand iti is going to go through some change in the curriculum the employability the skilling after skilling getting them employed as interns and funding that internship through csr funds i think this lot kind of if, if it is channelized rightly i think the youth will indeed be benefited uh, i think that's that has been the sentiments both on the education side and the employment side of the you no know, uh, the the budget all right thank you for the answers um do we have any more questions so you can use the chat box or i raise the hand on the feature i think we are we have no more questions so uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the speakers on behalf of infopark um mr an bhandari savit v gopal and pradeep a for simplifying a 62 page document to something that is uh, uh something that is uh, like a learning process for for the youth for company heads for students and our well wishers thank you so much uh, i know it is it's being a uh, i guess a uh, tiresome process to make it or bridge it to something that has to be said in few minutes had it been for hours it's easy but it's for a limited time it's not that
So, but you have done a well. You all, all, all of you, all three have done a wonderful job in simplifying the content and uh, giving new perspective and insights to what is something that everybody thinks is something uh, not easily understandable. So, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you, DSR, uh, you the firm for associating with Infopa for organizing this budget uh, post uh, budget uh, session and uh, we are looking forward to for uh, uploading the session on our social media platforms in including youtube um, and yes uh, i think we had we have had a good number of participants and on average we had 30 participants throughout uh, including students uh, company representatives it fellows of the government of kerala so we thank everyone for making, finding time, making time to be a part of the session. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed and had good takeaways from this. Uh, thank you all once again. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.